Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. We are on the 2017 Come Up Higher Tour, currently stopped over in Plano, Texas. <clears throat> Did you sleep good last night? Mm -hmm. How was the bed? Did you pay attention to when checkout time is? Uh -huh. Because you're all going with us on the 2017 Come Up Higher Tour because we're going to continue broadcasting morning light. It's an amazing thing. They've got grass out there, and it is absolutely humid mm -hmm. because of the rain bands and the weather system connected with Hurricane... Is it Howard? No, Harvey. Harvey. Hurricane... Mm -hmm. Harvey, lots of devastation down in Houston. We've got a lot of friends we were checking on in the Houston area uh, overnight. Uh, the water just doesn't have anywhere to go when it's coming down. I think they've said they've either had or they're about to have 50 inches of rain that they've had, either passed that mark or they've already passed it. So we pray. Father, for those that are in the Houston area, those that are affected by Hurricane Harvey, we, we lift them up. God, you're a God that says when the enemy comes in like a flood, you raise up a standard against him. Yes, So God, just raise your standard up. And bring rescue to the people in the Houston area and all of those affected Corpus Christi and Galveston by the hurricane of 2017. We just thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for strengthening the first responders and the rescuers that came out in their private boats and have spent the whole day and more than one day just out there pulling people out of their attics and off their rooftops. Thank you for taking care of our elderly, Father God, and uh, those that are in the margins of society that uh, they would not be overlooked in any way. We, we just know, God, that in the midst of such things, you are our rescue. The act of God is not the destruction. The act of God is the rescue that comes in the midst of it. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for it. We thank you for the people that are going to live yes. and be well for the, for the casualty count that will be non-existent or quite low because of your grace in that situation, Father, in the name of Jesus. So today we are studying in Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel 34. We'll be done with Ezekiel before we know it. <laughs> Finding the one shepherd. I know we, the uh, International House of Prayer, they use a theme for their conferences each year, the one thing. Well, this is about the one shepherd. What is the quality of pastoral leadership you are experiencing today? We can say that without uh, controversy that the, the different experiences people have with pastoral leadership in Christian culture today is not monolithic. It's not uniform. Some people are just very privileged to have godly pastors who love them with the love of the Lord. And then there are other pastors who that doesn't seem to be communicated for whatever reason. The pastoral care, perhaps, uh, could be better. That could be for a couple of reasons. That could be because of uh, just immaturity. Uh, I know, I remember the days I was a baby pastor. <coughs> Please forgive me. When I was a baby pastor in uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana, and... Uh, Looking back on that, when God put me into full-time ministry, I was 21, 22 years of age. And the only time I ever questioned the wisdom of God is he put somebody like that in that type of responsibility. And uh, I did the best that I knew how. But the, I can look back on those times and say, <clears throat> I probably would have handled it differently today because I'm not the same person. So if you have a young pastor... Or even a pastor that's just young in the Lord. He could be 68 years old and still not have a full maturity as much as he could have. Uh, well, we can, we can be gracious because every one of us can look back on times when uh, we could have acted with more maturity in Christ. Perhaps our pastor's under pressure, going through things in his personal life that isn't evident. 
to those of us out of the congregation. And perhaps we're bearing the brunt of the impact that has on his character. Let's be forgiving. And then, of course, there are those that Ezekiel 34 talks about, those that are unkind, those that are brutal, those that are abusive. Uh, they exist. And uh, whatever our response to that might be, we want it to be one of humility mm -hmm. and refusing to be wounded, refusing to be bitter, and just looking to the Lord again to bring us the one shepherd that Ezekiel 34 talks about. The promise is that God will set one shepherd over us who will feed us and nurture us with the Spirit of Christ. One of the greatest needs today is among leaders, among Christian leaders, that, that they would have pastors, pastors. If you were to ask your pastor, how do you think I would do, pastor, if for 10 years I just decided I didn't want to, to have a pastor? They'd say, well, you'd be in a backslidden condition. But did you know that most pastors don't have a pastor? The overwhelming majority of pastors do not have a pastor who's looking out for them. And so if you would go 10 years without a pastor and be in a um, wretched, backslidden condition, well, what do you think your pastor's experiencing and what he's fighting against? We need pastors. We need those who will pastor the pastors, mm -hmm. who will nurture them with the Spirit of Christ. In Ezekiel's day, the priest class, as we're going to see in our chapter, uh, they were the equivalent to modern-day pastors, and they were very corrupted, and they were abusive toward the people. Why? Because they were under pressure. That's not an excuse. That's just fact. Ezekiel's words give comfort to the struggling masses of God's people who we know. How do we know that pastoral culture is less than God wants it to be when the sheep are scattered? And the quote that Jesus makes in the Gospels, we'll read it after a while, about he saw the people were like sheep scattered without a shepherd. It comes from Ezekiel 34. It was caused by an abusive priest class who molested the people, who abused the people. And so if we can define Christian culture as scattered, it's because we don't have the one shepherd. We may have many shepherds, but we don't have the one shepherd. It's just like Jeremiah said, he said, many pastors have spoiled my vineyard. Well, we, it's easy to pick on the pastors. You know, that's kind of an American pastime in the American church. Let's have pastor for lunch on Sunday and just skewer the pastor, how he could have done it differently or how the church needs to go in a different direction. But let's understand, Paul said, be not many masters for in all things we receive the greater condemnation. Pastors can be the greatest problem because they are the greatest solution. Amen. When they are reflecting the spirit of the one pastor that is referred to in this chapter. So Father, reveal to us as we study this verse, the one shepherd. The one shepherd, and that our shepherds. If we don't have a one shepherd and he can't be that, won't be that, then God, you move him out and bring someone who has the heart of the one shepherd that this chapter so. talks about. And Lord, if we have no shepherd, if we've just given up and we're just in isolation and pulled out of corporeality, the corporate body of Christ, God, I pray you give us a heart to pray for that one shepherd so we can have what the one shepherd brings us, the green pastures, the still waters, yes. the protection. We cry out to you for that, for the pastors, pastor, Lord God. Yes. So many multiplied tens of thousands of pastors that are without a pastor, and they know that's not helpful to them. They could look at their own congregations and think what a horrible, terrible shape their, the people in their congregation would be if they decided they didn't need pastors, but they themselves don't have pastors. And they're in deep need. They're in great need. And we pray for them, Father God, as we look into this chapter that's before us today in the book of Ezekiel. So if you begin reading, Kitty, verse 1 through verse... 16 of Ezekiel chapter 34. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, ye clothe you with the, with the wool, ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. 
The diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed. That which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty you have ruled them. Think about that. You haven't brought that which was driven away. Did you know so many people feel like they've been driven away from institutional church, that they're actually an identifiable graphic today? There's a whole demographic of people that... Pew Research Foundation and the George Barna Foundation, who examine such movements in our culture, call it the out-of-church demographic. And it's people who are determined they want to live for God with all their heart, but they've just had it with organized church. My brother, uh, my middle brother, used to call that the church in exile. Mm -hmm. The Lord told us back years and years ago, God spoke to me in the 1997 he said, I want you to reach out to people that are no longer uh, entrenched, no longer plugged in to the church and say some things to them. He said, I want you to tell them they're not crazy, they're not backslidden, and they're not alone. Yeah. And then he said, I want you then to extend to them a basis of corporeality, a basis of fellowship and commonality that does not reproduce that which they fled from. And part of that for us, and God has dropped this in my heart, about the raising up of a digital, spiritual community. You know, they, built, they didn't build churches out in the midst of the Arabian desert because the people weren't there. You can build a church wherever people are. And right now, where the people's attention is, for the most part, is on in the digital environment, in the information superhighway. It's the place where missions is taking place. It's the place where community can be built. And I, I want to inspire you. I want to open your eyes to, to look beyond the boundaries of the traditional and the way things have been done to see a community, a, a mighty force, a spiritual people, a commonality in Christ, a commonwealth in Christ that can be established in spirit and in truth in the digital domain, a digital spiritual community. Go ahead, honey. Verse 5, And they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, you shepherds, ye hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, and because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Now think about that. They became a prey. In other words, they became a special interest group to the political predators that have taken advantage of the people of God since the days of Ronald Reagan, who uh, courted the religious right. But it is a historical fact that Reagan and a few other politicians, and from Reagan's day down to right now, have ever delivered on the uh, defined political platform of the Christian coalition, the moral majority, the Christian now that has become something you can't even name. It's so big. Why? Because they've been preyed upon why? Because the shepherds weren't paying attention. Because the shepherds were not portraying the strength of leadership that said, we'll change our nation on our knees. Yes, we'll go into the voting booth, but the real change in our nation is going to take place on our knees. And it'll be directed from the word of God that comes from our pulpits. It hasn't quite been that way because the pastors have been distracted by the things that Kitty's describing in our chapter. Verse 9, Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will search, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day, that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people, and gather them from the countries, and will bring them to their own land, and feed them upon the mountains of Israel, by the rivers, and in all the inhabited places of the country. 
I will feed them in good pasture, and upon high mountains of Israel shall be their their fold be. There shall there shall they lie in a good fold, and in fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, and bring again that which was driven away, and will bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. Isn't that interesting? Do you hear in Ezekiel 14 the words of Jesus, where he said the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost? It, it, what inspires me as we study the Old Testament is how many places you come across these passages that you could tell that the mind of Jesus was absolutely saturated in these passages and he saw himself and his mission as being a part of the solution rather than being a part of the problem as that one shepherd that this chapter goes on to speak about. See, Ezekiel is being directed by the Father here to speak against corruption in the leadership of the people. When we think of a shepherd, we think of pastors and church leaders. In Ezekiel's day, this would have applied specifically to the priest class. The leaders of the community of Ezekiel's time was made up of the king, the priest, and the prophets. The king, of course, was empowered through his lineage, having descended from the line of David. The prophets were raised up from time to time without any particular pedigree. God would just grab somebody like Amos who says, I was a plowman and no prophet. And God called him out from behind the plow to go speak the word. And the priesthood, however, was made up of those who generationally had received the role of leadership who came from the tribe of Levi. And they were appointed generation by generation to attend to the temple and to the people and to perform sacrificial rites in behalf of the people. Many of the priesthood and the family of the high priest, many of them were good and godly leaders. Those who did not follow that example were often very public, however, in their idolatrous and sinful ways. We can, Zedekiah was condemned, King Zedekiah, because he put altars to Baal, Chemosh, Ashtaroth, and other gods of the Egyptian, Babylonian, and Assyrian pantheon, right in the holy place, right in front of the altar of incense, with the Ark of the Covenant beyond. But we have to remember, he couldn't have done that without the cooperation of the pastors. And so pastors can decry the condition of our nation and say how ungodly the leadership of our nation is. But if the leadership of our nation has have ruled in ungodliness, it's because uh, they could not have done that without the cooperation of pastors and spiritual leaders. If you study history, there was a day in history, in the beginning with the Great Awakening, back in the 1700s, the first Great Awakening, that uh, rulers... Kings and potentates trembled when our pastors mounted the pulpit was the language they used. They'd mount the pulpit and they would lodge, they would lodge a, a message like a salvo out of a cannon and the nation would tremble. And the rulers knew that they ruled in the shadow of the immense power and influence wielded by pastors in our culture. It was, a, it was pastors and the spiritual movement that came through pastors that brought about uh, the uh, societal shift in the 1700s that resulted in the Revolutionary War. It was pastors and the monumental influence that pastors had upon the nation that resulted in the political shift that brought about the Civil War. And But now in the culture that we live in today, government and the rulers in government, they have the opinion that we worship God at their indulgence. And in fact, there's laws on the books. We can talk about Russia and communist China, but there are laws on the books originally sponsored by Lyndon Johnson and passed in legislature in the 1950s that says that if a church becomes uh, encroaches too much into the political realm, if they speak too stridently into the political uh, uh, atmosphere, that we will revoke their 501c3 status. In other words, that's government saying, you can worship your God all you want, but you keep your mouth off 
of the current affairs, the political affairs of this country. And we need to think of such things. We need to bear that in mind because why did that happen? It's because I don't know what the pastors were saying in the 1950s, but they obviously were not speaking a robust word of strength to cause the governments and the legislatures to pause or the president that signed that into law to pause and say, hold on now, wait just a minute. But there's coming a day, there's coming a fourth great awakening in our day that once again, the pastors in their pulpits and by whatever menu, venue or platform by which they speak will call, confront the nations and cause world leaders to tremble. Remember when Babylon didn't think they had to tremble before anybody and God sent uh, a dream to the king of Babylon and because he rebelled against it he ate grass for seven years like a madman. You think God cannot get a hold of whoever sitting in the Oval Office? It's not going to be by moving him through political machinations. It's about getting on our knees and believing God for the one shepherd. Mm -hmm. And if the pastor who's over us cannot, will not be that person, then we pray, not judgment upon the man or the woman, but pray that God will send us the one shepherd who will stand and speak, and we would have a, a nation of pastoral leaders who once again will uh, send forth the word like out of a cannon and cause Washington, D.C. and the halls of government to once again tremble at the things they have done in obscenity against the body of Christ, not because we threatened them or marched or thrown rocks or broken glass or turned over vehicles or set buildings on fire, but because we went to our knees and shook the nation by the power of God. If you don't believe it can happen, you need to go back and study your history because back during the Age of Enlightenment, uh, when Thomas Paine wrote Age of Reason, we were in a time of deep secularism where Christianity and spiritual things were at least, if not more, despised in that day than they are now. And God sent the second great awakening that rolled back the scourge of godless secularism a hundred years. And now since the days of Ronald Reagan, since the days when the church became more political than it was spiritual, that's begun to that that strength, that bastion has begun to crumble and fall. But I believe the church will wake up as it always has. And we'll begin first and foremost, if many pastors, according to Jeremiah, have spoiled the vineyard, uh, many pastors can correct the tide and cause things to shift mm -hmm. and turn. To, the, uh, to these people, Ezekiel is speaking. He's speaking against these corrupt leaders as abusers of the people and defilers of the temple. And because of this, verse 5 tells us, they are scattered because there is no shepherd. Now, you can listen to a message like that and say, well, I understand that message. I'm not quite sure it applies. Well, here's how we can know. It's not just up to our personal opinion as to whether or not this might be a descriptor of what's going on around us. Let's think about this. The verse 5 reference there, we can see Jesus saying the same thing when he looked upon the multitudes that followed him in Matthew 9, 36. Remember uh, Ezekiel saying, because... The shepherds have abused the people. They're scattered as sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus in Matthew 9, 36 said, When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. What is Jesus thinking today? He's moved with compassion as he looks upon this nation, as he looks upon the Western world. Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Does that, is that who we are? Are we scattered as, oh, no, that's not us, Brother Walden. We are, we're Americans. <laughs> we're the American church. We have solidarity. We're standing for God. Are we? And then he turned, notice what he said. He said there is sheep without a shepherd. And then he says something astounding. He defines the harvest. Now listen to what he says in Matthew 9, 36 and 37. He's looking at the people of God scattered as sheep without a shepherd. They're not wolves. They're not goats. They're sheep. That's a metaphor for born, the community of the redeemed. He says they have sheep without a shepherd. And then he turns and he says to his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labor is few. Who is the harvest? We think, oh yes, the harvest is that 
vast sea of unredeemed humanity. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's looking at his people. He's looking at people that are called by his name as those that are sheep that belong to him. He says they are scattered as sheep without a shepherd. So where is the harvest? The harvest is among the scattered, abused, molested, neglected sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ who have been scattered by unscrupulous leaders. Think about it. See, Whoa. Jesus didn't look at these people and say, good enough for them. Mm. It is a reality that among these multitudes, you got to remember, this is the same group of people that in just 24 months, is there will be those there that will say, crucify him, crucify him. But the compassion of Jesus reaches out to them regardless. It is important to note that Jesus defines these people again the scattered people of God as the harvest field that we are to pray God would send laborers to be sent un unto them. See, the word in verse 5 where he says the sheep are scattered, now, that, that's, that word will define, it will place us either in or out of those scattered people. I'm talking about Christian culture. The word scattered there in verse 5 means to be broken into pieces or segmented into into different parts or components. Mm -hmm. Now, does that not describe Christian culture today? Again, let the word is the discerner, Hebrews 4, 12. We can have an opinion about who that is, but an opinion is of no value. But what if the word itself tells us who this scattered fold is? It's broken into pieces. Did you know the world Christian encyclopedia says there are 300 major ecclesiastical traditions and at the current time, I've, it's been a while since I've updated my facts. At the current time, instead of 16,000 denominations, right now we have 33,000 distinct denominations in 238 countries. Wow. Now, regardless of the justification for these divisions, the makeup of modern Christianity defines us, we're broken up into pieces, as a scattered people, as a sheep without a shepherd. The denominational system that now defines Christianity is a manifestation of a shepherdless people. We can bemoan the denominational system uh, as being corrupt as the priesthood was in Ezekiel's day, but let me tell you something. The answer is not reform. Jesus is saying we need to pray that this scattered bunch will just get reformed. No, we need to pray that those corrupt shepherds uh, that Ezekiel talks about and Jesus is referring to by implication. They just need to reform. That's not what he says. The answer is simple. In verse 14, God send us shepherds who will feed us in good pastures, in a good fold, that we might lie down in safety. Those who will seek that which was lost and bring that which is driven away. You know what many pastors are saying now about the out-of-church demographic, it intimidates them, it impeaches the validity of what they're doing, and so they're pointing the finger and speaking against and prophesying the doom of the people who have disconnected from the institutional church, and they're prophesying their doom as a way of creating walls of fear and intimidation to keep the people that haven't left yet from departing. But that's not what the one shepherd does. The one shepherd goes out and seeks that who have been driven away. Listen, if we have, now they say that we are on track for the out-of-church demographic in the next 10 years to outnumber the number of people that are in the institutional church. But this chapter says they were driven away. They didn't just go away. They were driven away. And of course, the temptation and pastoral culture, yep, they're just backslid, that's all. Rather than leaving the church, they should have just, just got involved and just been a greeter, took over a Sunday school uh, lesson. Isn't that what we do? Somebody gets born again, two weeks later, they're the Sunday school superintendent. Two weeks later, we've got them in charge of something. They're helping pass the offering, working as a greeter, out there working in the parking lot, putting people to work, performance-based attachment. Rather than just simply giving them such verdant pasture and such deep rest in their souls that they are absolutely attached because they're receiving something from the church that can only come from the heart of Christ. 
Instead, we're putting them to work until they get so burnt out and so tired and so disillusioned and so discouraged. I remember one lady who uh, I just knew her by name. She was attending another church. She was teaching the adult Sunday school. She was working in children's church. She was cleaning the church during the week. She was uh, managing the church books. And her father, uh, elderly father, got a cancer diagnosis, went home, put a shotgun in his mouth, and blew his head off. And she lived three doors down from us. And she was devastated. And her pastor never came to see her. And this is not a large church. This is maybe 60 people. And he lived right there in the community and never once did he go. And I would watch her as a pastor. I just heard it what happened and I saw her coming and going from her house and my heart just went out to her. And, and I'm thinking, well, the pastor across the way, he's taking care of her. He knows he's one of his own flock. God kept saying, go to her ministered her. I said, no way, God, I am not going to be accused <laughs> of proselytizing somebody else's sheep, particularly when she's going through something. And then one day the Lord told me, he said, she was my sheep before she was that man's sheep. He said, I don't acknowledge the brands that pastors burn into the hide of their sheep because I didn't want to be accused of being a sheep stealer. That pastor was already bad-mouthing me in the ministerial association, and, and I just didn't want to exacerbate that situation. But the Lord gave me no choice, and I went to see her. And, and uh, she sobbed. She was broken and, and just deeply hurt, not only from the death of her father, but the treatment that she got at the hands of her pastor, who was so busy doing something else that after weeks after her father died, she, he, would not, he wouldn't say anything to her about it, would not go to her, would not minister to her. And so I just ministered to her. And uh, over time, she not only became someone, she started attending our church, but she became a friend. She became a close friend, became a confidant and an intercessor of our ministry. She traveled with us in ministry and was just a sweet, loving Christian uh, sister. And so what is driving the people away. Whatever is driving, it's not the people that have been driven away that need to be corrected. It's the institution that needs to be corrected. And it's not corrected by reform. It's corrected by praying, oh God, send us the one pastor who will seek that which has been driven away. Instead of saying, good enough for them, let them backslide. They'll come back when their lives fall apart. Not so. That's not the heart of God. But we see the denominational system the denominational system is defined in its, in its makeup as the scattered flock that is described in Ezekiel and by Jesus in Matthew chapter 9. What's wrong with the church? Why do we have so many denominations? Because we don't have the one shepherd. We don't have the one shepherd. Has God called you to be the one shepherd? Has God called you to be that one shepherd who will feed the flock, who will gather that which is driven away? See, the answer is not some new program. It's binding up the broken heart. The answer is not some kind of enticement or manipulation. Just get a new smoke machine. Let's get a nice rock band. Let's lower, let's lower the lights and make it like uh, some at church's entertainment. That's not the answer. It's pastors that will bind up the broken heart and strengthen those who are sick. And I tell you, if the institutional church has become so corrupt that it can no longer effectively do that as it should, then let's raise up a digital spiritual community and let's do it where we can find the people. Let's go out where the people are and have a view not just to spew our opinion, but to take our presence in social media as a divine, sacred calling to represent not ourselves, but to represent the one shepherd and to speak life and to bind up the brokenhearted, and to restore that which has been driven away. It doesn't matter whether they're in a brick-and-mortar church. What matters is, are they in a vibrant, dynamic, nurturing, secure, spiritual community by which their hearts are being touched, by which they're being lifted up and drawn together and deployed in the purposes of God in a substantive way? That's what God is raising up marketplace apostles and, in, dare I say, internet apostles, digital apostles, to go out and create this community, my brothers and sisters. Amen. I'm going to have Uticas falling down out of the beams. If I don't. <laughs> 
you're going to carry on. <laughs> Verse 17 through the end of the chapter, please. And you're right, Sarah. It's in art shows and art stores and grocery stores and Walmart. It's everywhere. Amen. So verse 17, as for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the he goats. Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures, and to have drunk the deep waters, but you must foul the residue with your feet. As for my flock, they eat that which is, ye have trodden with your feet, and they shall drink that which you have fouled with your feet. Now, notice what he's saying. He's describing the ewes and the goats. I'm sorry, the rams and the goats, the mature ones. He said, you've drank of the deeps. Yes, we're deep in God. This is the deep Bible study. He said, yes, you've drank of the deep, but you fouled the waters with your feet, with your walk. People who have deep truth, people who have drunk, drank of deep truth, who have pulled deep truth into themselves, but then they fouled the waters of the deep with the contamination of an ungodly walk. And people that come after them who don't know of the deeps saying, I'm not about to drink that. Look at that person's life. So those of us that believe we're charter members, card-carrying members of the Deeper Life Club, we better make sure that we aren't drinking of the deep and then fouling the waters with the character of our walk by not demonstrating the love of Christ. Receive that as an as a admonition from the Holy Spirit today. Amen. Verse 19, As for my flock, they eat that which you have trodden with your feet, and they drink that which you have fouled with your feet. Therefore saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle, because you have tr thrust with side and with shoulder and pushed all the diseased with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey. And I will judge between cattle and cattle. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And the Lord will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will make them a covenant of peace, and will cause evil beasts to cease out of the land. And they shall dwell safely in the wilderness, and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places around my about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the shower to come down in his season, and there shall be showers of blessings. The tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord, when I have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them. And they shall no more be a prey unto the heathen, neither shall the beasts uh, of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will raise up them for a plant of renown, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. Thus shall they know that I am the Lord their God, am with thee, that I the Lord their God am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. And ye, my flock, the flock of my pastures, are men, and I am your God saith the Lord God. So in verse 17, the father's, he's turning from addressing the shepherds to addressing the flock. And Notice that he isn't speaking to a singular sheep. Every one of us should have a flock that we are a part of in order to place ourselves in the number to which these statements apply. You are a sheep of God's pasture, and it is against the nature of a sheep to live a solitary existence like a goat in the rocks and the crags. Now you need to think about that. Now I understand. I, I, won't, I won't dispute those of you that feel you just feel called out of institutional church. I get that. But it's just like Jesus when he told his disciples, he said, you don't consider yourselves a scribe or a Pharisee. He said, well, I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter heaven. So if you feel that uh, your sensibilities, your spiritual sensibilities are so acute that you cannot place yourself in harm's way by going to the institutional church. It is th that the corruption that you see is there, that you don't accept, is so impactful upon your acute spiritual sensibilities, then that gives you a greater responsibility 
It does not opt you out. It does the contamination or the pollution that you see in institutional church does not give you a predicate, does not give you a, a justification for opting out of being a part of the member of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And it's a cop-out to say, well, I'm just a member of the mystical body of Christ wherever they are. I beg your pardon. That is not a concept that is defined in the New Testament paradigm. Every one of us should have a flock. If you're not going to go to a brick-and-mortar church, then you're, guess what? You're a house church pastor. If you're not going to a brick-and-mortar church, guess what? You're a marketplace pastor. You're a pastor of that business where you work or that business that you own. You have a calling to be corporate. And if you're not being corporate, then you're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. He didn't say it had to be in a brick-and-mortar church. There was no such thing as the brick-and-mortar churches that, when that word, those words were spoken. But you must be connected. There must be spiritual family. There must be those with whom you connect where your primary commonality is in Christ. And you are part of a redeemed community of believers nurturing one another, caring for one another, and establishing a testimony of confronting evil in your community. And if you're not in that, guess what? You're called to start that. Mm -hmm. Now I'll be expecting an email from you this weekend for me to begin to pray for you because you're going to start doing that this weekend. Are you listening? Every one of us should have a part of a flock that we're a part of. You are a sheep of God's pasture. The passage goes on to speak against the goats in the midst and the elder rams, again, who made it difficult for the ewes and lambs to find refreshing in the deeps of God. Listen, sometimes the greatest source of difficulty in the church are those that have been there the longest. It's like the kid that got saved and he was filled with joy and he's overflowing. He's glowing in the dark. He's levitating two feet off the altar. And some gal's been in the church for 40 years comes up and she says, this joy that you have will not last. One day you'll be just like us. And his thought was, Lord, kill me now. <laughs> These elder rams and goats are held accountable. If you see yourself as mature, if the curve or the trajectory of your maturity places you in the top 10 percentile of that in your opinion, of the level of maturity in your church, then that means you're held accountable. Do you see suffering in the church? Pa pastor ought to do something about that. Can you believe? Can you believe that somebody could sit in that church and suffer like that? And where's the pastor? Where's the assistant pastor? No, it's your responsibility. Amen. God told you, well, I don't mind the pastor. No, if you don't have a badge, you can't go in the altar. Oh, okay, then get kicked out. Then go down, do what God said, and get kicked out. And you'll know you, you did what God told you to do. Oh, I don't want to rock the boat. You don't? Maybe that boat, if it's in that bad a shape, maybe it just needs to sink. One pastor said, uh, he who sees the need meets the need. You see it, God's enlightening you to do something about it. And because those that said, I see, God says, I'm going to judge between cattle and cattle. We're waiting on the we're waiting on the end of time. You need to know that God will judge between cattle and cattle, between sheep and sheep. And the ones that are supposed to, who are seeing the need are the ones that are if you see it, it's your job to meet it. I don't care if it suits the protocol of the church or not. Absolutely. I don't care if you've been through the new convert class or not. I don't care if you've been through the prayer workers uh, course or not. <laughs> God doesn't acknowledge such things. It doesn't mean you can't be benefited by them. But just because you haven't been jumped through the hoops and done such things and left it to someone else doesn't mean you're not called. Now, oh, I'm, I don't want to raise problems. I might get in trouble. So what? Would you rather be in trouble with the church or be in trouble with God? Hello. I get that now, Pastor. I'm not trying to start fights, but let me tell you something, Pastor. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Rules are made by elders that want to get to bed early. Maybe you need to loosen up on some of the rules because the scripture says that uh, where there is no ox, the crib is clean, but much profit comes from the labor of the ox. The problem is, pastor, sometimes we don't want to clean out the stable, so we get rid of the ox. We don't allow people to be the body of Christ because we don't like cleaning up the mess. 
But God says, if you'll let the mess come and be willing to clean it up, he will profit you. And we think that we're going to grow our churches by not having any messes. God says, if you don't have messes, you're not going to have any profit. And we know what they shoveled out of the stable now, don't we? So what is the answer for all of this downturn and this systemic corruption in the flock in Ezekiel's day? Verse 23 tells us that the Father will bring us one shepherd, even my servant David. Now prophetically, this is speaking of Jesus, who came to overturn the tables of the money changers and the establishment of the first century church as his one true flock. And in that regard, we can look at our connection or lack of connection to the culture of the first century church as the metric of our authenticity as a flock. Is there any connection? Is there any commonality between what we do for church and what they did in the early church? If we can't find the registration points where it matches up, then we have rendered ourselves inauthentic in the eyes of God. See, there is a church that Jesus told Peter he would build. (coughs) And it's not the disconnected institutional church. Just because you're all in one building does not mean you are assembled together. You're gathered, but you're not assembled. Neither is it the solitary person claiming to be a part of the invisible, perfect, mystical church. No, it's a flesh and blood community. People who are in one another's lives, walking out corporate relationship to one another in the midst of a sinful and imperfect world. God's promise is that through leadership, pastors who have the character of that one shepherd will feed us. And I say to you, if you can say yes and amen, to this message that you have a calling upon your life. Some of you have a calling to pastor thousands. Some of you have a calling just to pastor a handful of people in your community. But every one of us are called to commonality in Christ and to connection to the corporate body of Christ. That may not be in a brick and mortar church. It might be. Paul said he robbed synagogues. He went into places where he knew he'd get beat up and thrown out. And today, going into some institutional churches, even ones that have full gospel, charismatic, Holy Ghost-filled, baptized in fire in Jesus' name in Cleveland, you can get thrown out of just simply by walking in the kingdom. But it's time for us to rise up as the elder rams in the flock of God who say we see and to be a solution to the pollution. Well, I just don't know. It's my calling. Well, somebody's got to do it. So why don't you do it till somebody else comes along? You might find that that somebody else is you. You might find that the one shepherd is standing up on the inside of you to be a part of the solution and not part of the problem, much of what we see today. So help us, Father, to recognize the shepherd on the inside of us because we can can shepherd people in the grocery. We can shepherd them in the post office. If If we have willing hearts, and last week we taught about being willing to be made willing. So help us in our resolve to be willing to be used by you, Father. We think of the times that we've just been able to encourage somebody, just a pat on the back, a little bit of hug, a handshake, a smile. Father, from that to the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, a prophetic word over the person's life, to bring them the knowledge of a truth. Help us to be willing to be made willing in Jesus' name.